All right, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, we are very excited to have Patrick Cummins here from the Connecticut Audubon Society give his talk on landscaping for um, for what is it? birds and birds. wildlife. Yes, birds and wildlife. Um, my name is Aaron Leflin. I'm the director of the New Canaan Land Trust. Um, we are thrilled to co-sponsor this event with Planet New Canaan. And um, while I have the captive audience, just wanted to give a plug for some of our upcoming events we have this month. Um, on April 20th, we have our Stonewall Building Workshop. We also are doing an Earth Day event on April 22nd, where we'll be releasing a Peregrine Falcon with Wildlife in Crisis, as well as doing a guided walk of our Livingston Higley property. And then on April 28th, we have an Arbor Day event, where we'll be doing a tree planting workshop. Um, and we have a bunch of family-friendly activities like scavenger hunts um, and refreshments will be served, so it'll be a great event. And uh, best way to learn about these events is to subscribe, to subscribe to our newsletter. We've got a sign up sheet in the back there. So I encourage you all to do that to join us at other events in the future. Um, but without further ado, I'll turn it over to Robin, who will give a quick intro and pitch for Planet New Canaan. Thank you. I'm Robin Bates Mason with Planet New Canaan. And uh, we are very excited to be co sponsoring this event with uh, uh, New Canaan Land Trust. Um, I saw Patrick about six months ago with New Canaan Beautification League, and I just thought he was so great, I wanted him to come back uh, for everyone to hear him. But I uh, just wanted to announce first that with Planet New Canaan, we have a program with Copia Nursery over the border in Vista, and from April 15th until the end of May, for every $75 of native pollinating plants that you buy, $10 worth of native plants will be donated to New Canaan Nature Center. So um, if you're inspired after this program, we do hope you'll go and, and plant for the birds and the bees and also help out the Nature Center. Uh, so without further ado, uh, introduce Patrick Cummins. He's the Executive Director of the Connecticut Audubon Society and he's a graduate of Trinity College and has worked in the bird conservation field for over 20 years. Patrick began his career with the Connecticut Audubon Society uh, undertaking bird surveys at the McKinney National Wildlife Ref Refuge and serves as a director of the bird conservation for Audubon, Connecticut for nearly 17 years before becoming the Connecticut Audubon of, before coming to the Connecticut Audubon Society. He is a past president, president of the Connecticut Ortho, Ornithological Association. He is a member of the Connecticut Forest Practice Advisory Board, a position appointed by the governor and a founding member and past chair of the Friends of the Silvio Conte National Fish and Wildlife Refuge. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Hopefully this mic, well, hopefully I may have to use this mic. Um, well, hi. Um, so as you heard, I'm the executive director of the Connecticut Audubon Society, and we are uh, one of the state's oldest conservation organizations. We're a statewide independent Audubon Society. We were formed in 1898. We have um, about 3,200 acres of land that we manage throughout the state. Uh, including uh, several sanctuaries in, in Fairfield. Uh, our closest sanctuary to here is probably in Westport, our Smith Richardson Sanctuary, where we've just undergone a nearly $300,000 habitat restoration project. One of my board members here tonight, Charlie Stebbins, and uh, he, was, he, he was a lead, um, uh, a leader on that project, and really it was just one of the most amazing conservation restoration projects I've been involved in. So if you get a chance to go up and see Lower S Smith Richardson, it's an amazing place for birds and for other wildlife. We also do have seven nature centers, so six or seven depending on how you count them, throughout the state, uh, including uh, two in Fairfield, and we have our Mil Milford Point Coastal Center, which is just an amazing place to go see shorebirds and, and other coastal birds. Uh, our newest sanctuary is up in Sherman, which is not that far away, um, and it's about 800, well, 835 acres, our Deer Pond, Pond Farm Sanctuary. It's absolutely spectacular. It was the former estate of, of Kathy and Walter Riston who donated it to us, and uh, we're just thrilled to be the stewards of that amazing property. So we, our website is ctaudubon.org. I have some materials in the back of the room. If you're not a member, please consider joining. We do a lot of great conservation work. We're involved in um, advocacy for birds, other wildlife and their habitats, both up in Hartford and down in DC. I was just down in C DC last week uh, advocating for state wildlife grants program and, and, and a, a really exciting proposal called the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, which would bring a lot more funding for wildlife conservation uh, to the entire country, but including to Connecticut. We do environmental education programs both in schools and our centers and for adults as well. We have an eco-travel program based in, in Essex 
And uh, you know, one of our highest priorities is maintaining our 3,200 acres and to the highest of our abilities to make sure that it's really great habitat for birds and other wildlife. And we also get involved in direct conservation efforts like uh, uh, stewarding piping plovers and other coastal water birds up and down the coast and providing input to land trusts and other members on how to best manage their habitat. So please do uh, feel free to take some materials in the back of the room and, and, and consider joining. Today I'm going to be talking about landscaping for wildlife. And uh, I do have a couple of fo folks to thank. I want to thank another one of my board members, Patrick Lynch, who did a lot of the graphics for this presentation. And also, uh, I, I was, uh, uh, my former employer, Audubon, Connecticut, uh, was gracious enough to let me use some of the slides from an old presentation. So I want to give them a shout out. They're the ones that have Audubon Greenwich uh, nearby here. So first we're going to uh, consider the wood thrush. Uh, it's a fairly common bird, nesting bird throughout Connecticut. They, they nest in New Canaan. Uh, their song is, is this beautiful ethereal flute-like song that they usually sing early in the morning and the evenings. And it's a species that's, um, they like deciduous woodlands. Uh, uh, one, one of the limiting factors for them around here is the understory. They, they, they like to have things that are 10 feet and below, a lot of vegetation. And um, uh, around here, there are a lot of deer and a lot of invasives in the understory. So we're, we're losing wood thrush. And they've de actually declined by about 70% since the 1960s. There are migratory species. They're found in the eastern deciduous woodlands here, which is actually, when you think about it, it's not that big of an area. Our eastern deciduous woodlands are about the size, a little bit smaller than the Amazon rainforest. You always hear a lot about the plight of the Amazon rainforest and how threatened it is. Well, the eastern deciduous woodlands are just as threatened, if not more threatened. And they've been impacted in some cases for, for more than 400 years by human activities. They migrate each year. They aren't back in Connecticut yet. Uh, they're probably uh, just hitting the Gulf Coast, but they each year they fly right across the Gulf Coast down here to Central America, southern Mexico, Guatemala, um, Nicaragua, almost, and down into Panama. Um, and then this time of year, they're flying, again, this, this trans-Gulf journey nonstop across the Gulf of Mexico. They land on the Gulf Coast, and then they make their way back up to New England and, and their other nesting locations throughout North America. They like unbroken, relatively unbroken woodlands. So they really have a, a three-legged stool that they need to uh, be successful. They need good, high-quality nesting habitat. They also need high-quality wintering habitat, the montane forests of, of Central America. But sometimes the neglected part of this three-legged stool is their migratory stopover habitat. And if they have a great nesting year, or, or they do fine in the winter, just one bad stop on migration can be a problem for them. Migration is really, it, it, it's a chain that's only as strong as its weakest link. This happens to be Fairfield. Here's my office. This is the Birdcraft Sanctuary, an amazing place to visit in May uh, in migration. It's only about six acres, but all of the birds just get concentrated in there. And you just, you can have as many as 20 species of warblers in a given day there. It's partly because this is really a sterile landscape for birds. There are some trees and some yards, and I'm sure they get some migrants as well, but there's not much understory in those, those, the, those areas. Uh, there, there's the taller trees, and then there's the lawn. And there's usually not that much in between. There's cats, there's pesticides. If they find themselves over here, it's probably not going to be a high quality stopover for them. But if they come here to the birdcraft sanctuary, they're going to you know, have a great stay. It's a four star, star uh, uh, hotel for them. <laughs> But there are things that you can do if you live in this landscape to improve habitat for these migrant birds and to be a good, uh, a good innkeeper, if you will. And we have tons of birds that come through our area. And actually, this time of, nut, this time of year, uh, when there's a south wind, you can go and, and get on certain unfiltered radar sites, and you'll see blue blobs that kind of go out at this time of night, and then they shrink back down at the end of the night uh, as, as uh, dawn breaks. And meteorologists call those ground clutter, and ornithologists call them birds. <laughs> this is actually a, a study of the migratory stopover uh, as, as, as measured on radars. This is uh, uh, done by uh, the US Fish and Wildlife Service. This is, it's kind of hard to tell where we are, but this is Cape Cod over here. There's, there's actually not that many birds showing up in eastern New England. Eastern Connecticut, 
there's this huge concentration here at the, at the mouths of the, uh, of the Thames and, and the Connecticut rivers. And also down here in Fairfield County, there's, there's high concentrations of birds that, that show up here. Uh, and they, they migrate at night. And as the dawn breaks, they need to find some place safe to winter over. Because if they're flying around during the day, then there's hawks and falcons, and they're going to pick them off. So they need to get out at, at, at first light. It's also another big flyway throughout the uh, highlands of Connecticut and going in down into New York City. Now, Connecticut, another thing about Connecticut, we have the highest percentage of any state in the country of what's known as the urban wildlife interface. That is where there's really high quality habitat paired with a lot of people living here. And, and actually Connecticut is one of the places in, in the world where we have more people living with more high quality uh, habitat intermixed with it than almost anywhere else in the world. Um, it's this orange color on the map. The, uh, the, the darker red colors are the pure urban habitats. The lighter colors here are the more wilderness habitats. And this, this really requires, this means that how we manage our cities and our towns and our yards has a bigger impact on the wildlife around us than it would be in, in an urban area because there's not as much wildlife or in a more wild area because there's not as much, as, as much of that interface. So it gives us a, a lot of responsibility for managing our habitats healthily for our wildlife. So if you want to improve your surroundings, your yard or your community garden for birds, what are some of the things you want to take into account? Well, what watershed is it in? Which way does the water come off of your property? Every drop of rain and every snowflake that falls in this area eventually ends up in Long Island Sound via some other conduit. So if you know which which way the water goes off of your property. You can do things that will improve the water quality, sort of trap the water, infiltrate it into, impermeable, into permeable surfaces so that it's going to be better off for Long Island Sound and, and the intermediate waterway. What sort of wildlife do you have in the area? If you want to do things for cardinals, you're in luck around here. If you want to do things for roadrunners, you're probably not going to have much luck. What is the history of your landscape? Was it a, an old field? Was it agricultural? Was it formally developed and you're trying to rehabilitate it? Uh, that can really play into what sort of soils you may have and what things will grow well in that area. What ecosystems are you a part of? Are you close to a forest or, or, or a woodland? Are you close to marshes? Are you close to grasslands? And these, you'll want to take different things into account in those different situations. The geography, including what sort of soils you have, what aspect you have in terms of are you, uh, are you on a hill where it's a south-facing hill where you're going to get more sun? Are you on a north-facing hill where you won't going to have as much sun and it may be cooler? So that'll, that'll influence what sort of plants will do well in your yard and soils are oh so important. The Connecticut Agricultural Experiment can actually test your soils and, and give you an idea of what plants might do better. And then the weather. Uh, you know, if you want to plant something that's native to Florida, most likely it's not going to do well here. Native plants are going to do much better. You're not going to have to care for them as much. You're not going to have to give them as much water. You're not going to have to baby them with chemicals and fertilizer. And your home fits into this matrix. So know your landscape context. That's very important. Are you in the middle of a woodland? In which case, your yard may be a fragmenting feature. And there are a lot of things that you can do to mitigate that fa fact, making your edges a little bit softer. If you have a big flat edge that just goes right up to the woods and then you have lawn, that's going to be much more damaging to those woodlands than if you have a soft edge that's a little feathered and have uh, uh, you know, a transition from your lawn into those woods. And I'll talk a little bit more about structure coming up. And we have a lot of woodlands in Connecticut. From a lot of places, you look out over the landscape and it just looks like a big forest. Uh, there are houses mi mixed in there. This is from Mohawk State Forest. I uh, forget what town that's in, but it's up in Litchfield County. And um, uh, you look out there and it looks like this vast wilderness. There, there's actually a lot of yards mixed in there as well. Do you live near an open area? In which case, planting trees may be the absolute worst thing you can do. This actually is a site in Stonington that, that hosts nesting bobolinks. And grassland birds need a certain area. They need an open aspect. They need a view so they can see predators coming. And they need to be able to see it as they're flying over. If you started planting trees in here and breaking up that openness, then you're going to ruin the habitat for these open country birds. Do you live in suburbia? 
in which case you probably have a lot more flexibility. Almost anything you can do here in terms of planting native plants or increasing the structure is going to sort of take the edge off this ecological desert that, that bird, migrant birds may find themselves in. And there are migrant birds flying over habitats like this all the time. And also, if you live in the city, you can really have a big impact, too, by just planting a few nectaring plants to, to benefit pollinators. Uh, native plants is important. And then wherever you live, don't plant invasives and try to get rid of them, invasive non-native species. <coughs> so what are some things that you want to take into account in, in landscaping your yard, some specific things? Well, water is very important. I'm going to get a little bit more in, in depth into that a little later. You can put up feeders, and I could give a presentation all about feeding. It, 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 it's pretty complicated. It's overall beneficial to birds, and the way you can know that is if you look at the trends of feeder birds around the country, almost all of them are doing well. So it's, it's, not, it's not harmful to feed birds. There are some things, if you have bear in the area, you want to make sure you're not feeding them in, in the season when the bear are going to be out there. You don't want to... You don't want to uh, feed cowbirds in the nesting season. That's a species that lays eggs in the nests of other birds, and they like grains. So if you're feeding cracked corn or millet in the nesting season, that's probably not a good thing. There's a lot of complexities about feeding. The most important thing, I think, about feeding is it's good for us. It is just a wonderful activity. It's a great way to bring your family together and to connect yourself to nature and see these amazing creatures that we share the world with. You can plant certain plants for bees and butterflies. That's important. I get into that a little, quite a bit in depth there. You also want to take into account different times of year. Certain plants are going to provide benefit in the summertime. Others are going to provide that benefit in the winter or the fall or the spring. Uh, nuts and acorn trees can be very beneficial to birds and other wildlife. Again, fall and winter plants, there are certain plants that are going to benefit the, the, uh, the, the birds in the fall and the winter. Nesting boxes is another complicated subject. Uh, the main thing I'll just say about, there's a whole variety of nest boxes you can put up. They do require some stewardship on your part. You can't just put up the box and forget about it. Uh, so uh, that's what I'm going to say there. Of course, you're not going to put snag. Well, you might want to keep snags in, 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 um, in your landscape. That is dead trees, dead standing trees. As long as it's not a creating a safety hazard, that can be beneficial to woodpeckers. It can be beneficial to insects. And all, other birds will then come in and use the cavities that the woodpeckers drilled. Uh, you're not going to ha uh, build cliffs, most likely, or caves. But those are also things that, if you have them on your property, uh, you want to you want to take that into account. Brush and rock piles are very important. Brush piles create create shelter for the birds. They sort of give them a fighting chance if you have hawks that are coming into your yard or, or uh, cats. Please keep cats indoors, but you may have neighborhood cats. Um, also gives feeding areas. And, and in the wintertime, I like to scatter a little bit of seed under a very loose uh, brush pile. The birds really love that. Rock piles are something you don't think much about, but it, it can create um, some thermal dampening. That is, in the wintertime, it stays warmer around those rock piles. In the summertime, it stays cooler. And that can benefit salamanders, all sorts of insects. And there are a lot of birds that like to go foraging around rock piles. Dust beds and grit. Uh, some birds like to take dust baths. There are certain butterflies that like to puddle on mineral-rich uh, 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 soils. And uh, some birds need grit, particularly calcium, so crushed oyster shells, th that can be beneficial. A lot of the finches really like that, and, and, uh, uh, um, and, and all birds really need calcium for, for eggshell production. So again, you want to take into account this full cycle. Uh, you, you can have a beautiful garden that, that just blossoms one week a year, and that's not going to be as beneficial if you take into account, all right, well, what's going to be good in the winter time, the early winter, the late winter, the early spring, the late spring? And you want to plan it so that you actually have nectar and to attract the pollinators from the earliest times of spring, your flowering trees, all the way to the first frost, which would be your asters, most likely, and, 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 and uh, your chrysanthemums. I'll say right now, I'm not a strict nativist. I'll get a little bit more into that. But native plants are incredibly important for, for, for wildlife in our area. Water is one of the best things you can do in your yard to attract birds, to see birds, and to help birds and other wildlife. These are cedar waxwings, beautiful bird. They're moving through right now, trying to clean out all the last winter berries. But uh, they won't come to your feeder. But if you landscape right, you can attract them to your yard. And if you offer water, sometimes you'll get a big flock of cedar waxwings coming. You can go extreme and plant a whole water garden. This is a water garden at my former uh, office at Stratford Point. Uh, 
in Stratford, Connecticut. You can see the lighthouse over here at Stratford Point Light. This was all a lawn uh, when we started. And you can see it's surrounded by water, but that's all brackish water. What was missing in this system was fresh water. So I was able to, to interest a funder in funding this, and we put in this beautiful recirculating, about 3,000 gallon water feature with a heater. It runs year round. We planted it with native, uh, native plants. We even have this little stone bird bath over here for the shire birds. And it's amazing, the birds and other wildlife that use this. Another view of it. So if you can, and you can put something in like this, this can just be utterly transformative of not just your yard, of your whole neighborhood. We even put a bog garden in here. Filled, up, filled it up with peat and then put in bog plants, carnivorous plants, uh, sundews and pitcher plants. Every evening in, in the nesting season, or every afternoon in the nesting season, this guy would show up and, and, and his family. Uh, they, it's, a, it's an orchard oriole. It's a bird's not going to come to your feeder, although if you put oranges out, you might be able to attract them. But he would come, he would take a bath, and then, then his mate would come, and, and, and the young birds, the helpers, and we'd sometimes have seven or eight of these guys, but, but uh, he was really, uh, uh, this was right out my office window. But you don't need to have this big elaborate water feature, although that's amazing if you can. One of the things you want to take into to planning is that you can't just have deep water. The birds need some edges to that water. So you want to keep different layers of water so that the birds can get in here in the edges and take the bath. You might want to put a rock in it. It has less water that you need to keep fill uh, and uh, uh, give, offers a, a perch in there for the birds. Also, sometimes putting some emergent vegetation, it can help keep, keep the water cleaner. Also helps dragonfly larvae, nymph, to, to come in and out of the water as they, they metamorphize from, from uh, an aquatic organism to a flying or organism. Even a simple bird bath can be really helpful, especially if you can put a heater in it and keep it, uh, keep it liquid in the coldest times of, of the winter. The two most important times, the drought of summer and the coldest days of winter. That's when water becomes the limiting factor. And there's some tricks. You can put an agitator or a, a little pump in it, recirculating pump. That sound will bring the birds in from, from, from far away. You can even just hang, hang a bucket over your bird bath and have a little drip in it so that they'll, they'll hear that drip, drip, drip. Or you can actually get special dripper hoses. This actually helps keep your, your water fresh, keeps the algae down a little bit, and uh, uh, keeps mosquito larvae from getting uh, too established in there. Do keep your water clean, please. So what are some of the general principles? Basically, it's reducing your lawn and creating a whole lot of different structure. Yeah, we all need lawns, especially if you have young children or grandchildren, places to gather with our friends. But if you can plan your yard out to create some pollinator meadows, to create some, some butterfly gardens, to create some shrubs, small trees, taller trees, maybe have some water on there, put a feed plot in perhaps, you're going to be a lot more, you're going to be a much higher quality habitat for your resident and your migrating and your wintering birds. So this is an illustration of succession, really. So if we went out and just like torched the earth and, and, and ended up with bare ground, eventually it's going to grow back into a forest through this successional phase. You're going to have bare rock and soil. Eventually lichens and moss will get in there and a few annuals, then some perennials, and then you'll get shrubs, then little small trees will start to go up, and taller and taller and taller trees until you get to this uh, mature climax forest. This is also an, another illustration of the sort of habitat structure that you want to think about when you're planning your, your, um, uh, your landscaping, because each one of these phases is important to birds and other wildlife, and different things like to forage at different levels. We think of birds of things as things that fly, but they just fly from place to place. Most of the time, they're on some sort of substrate. That is, they're hopping around the ground if they're robins. They're crawling up the tree trunks if they're a creeper or a woodpecker or a, or, or a um, nuthatch. They're in the shrubs if they're a warbler or a sparrow. Uh, and, and, different tree, and different birds and different butterflies like to forage at different heights. So keeping vertical structural diversity. And, and the ultimate is if you can have this stadium effect where it's all in one place. And, and, and if you want a perfect world, it should be east facing or west facing. Uh, because in the east facing, then the sun hits it in the morning 
and it co comes up at different times and you see that shadow uh, moving. And as that shadow moves, that's when the birds are foraging. When, that, when the sun first hits it, they're stunted insects. It's a little warmer. The birds are trying to warm up and that's where they're going to forage. Uh, west facing, same effect in the evening. But it doesn't really matter. It, the main thing is that you want the stadium effect or or to at least uh, to try and take all those vertical structures into account. This is uh, my former office. This is uh, another former office up in Southbury, Connecticut, the Bent of the River, which is uh, Audubon, Connecticut Sanctuary, an absolutely beautiful place. And it shows you that stadium effect. There's this organic lawn down here, plenty of clovers in it, lots of uh, uh, low, sh low forbs and wildflowers like these Rudbeckia, bl black-eyed Susans. Uh, there's, there's taller uh, wildflowers like these uh, tall goldenrod here, really tall wildflowers. These are uh, uh, um, uh, Ver Vernonia altissima, the uh, uh, tall ironweed. There's uh, several species of Joe pieweed over here. And then back behind that are some native shrubs that we put in, uh, including uh, cranberry bush viburnum. Then there's some smaller trees back here, which happen to be star magnolias, uh, which is a wonderful non-native, going up into your red cedars and then all the way into this magnificent red oak. So no matter whether a bird likes to feed on the ground, like to, likes to be at ankle, uh, a knee, shoulder, uh, waist level, uh, head height, or all the way up in the crowns of the trees, it's going to find what it needs. Just another view a couple of weeks later. Oh, yeah, there's a butterfly bush in there. Um, but, you know, it's, it, it's an actual beautiful place, and it, it, it's like a busy city with all the insects that are coming in and out of there. And then in migration, it's just loaded with birds. Another view, and I show this because there's a path on the back side of it. And if you're, you're taking, if you're going to plant a garden like this, take into account your enjoyment of it, being able to get in and out of the garden and to see the different aspects of it. I, you notice how, how dense this is? That's very important for the structure as well. You don't want this formal garden with one coneflower here and one goldenrod here as a showcase. You want a lot of variety of structure and really dense structure, but also edges are important and, and it's okay to have paths through it so you can go out there and enjoy it a little more. This is another garden that we helped design. This was at uh, Lighthouse Point Park in the city of New Haven. It's a, an amazing urban park. It's a great place for, to see butterflies and migrating hawks. And again, you can see that stadium effect going from the lawn up to the tallest trees. It doesn't necessarily need to be that classic stadium effect. It can, as long as you're taking all those factors into account. This is at Audubon Greenwich uh, nearby here. Uh, the, the other Audubon, Audubon, Connecticut. You can see this lawn. You see the forbs here, you see scattered small trees and a few uh, uh, um, climax trees. And there's a little bit of forest over here. It's, the important thing is, is vertical structural diversity. Another key thing, please minimize or don't use pesticides and, and fertilizers. Get your soil tested so you know what is missing, so you're not loading it up on, on, herb, uh, on, on um, fertilizers that it may not need. They're going to wash into Long Island Sound, contribute to hypoxia. Pesticides, they are non-discriminatory. They kill the good insects along with the bad insects. In some cases, they kill birds. In some cases, they can harm small pets. Children, they're not the best thing. Uh, so there are ways to manage your lawn organically, and the less pesticides you use, the better it is for your health and the better it is for the variety of wildlife in your area. And, you, you know, if you have this healthy yard, you never know what's going to show up. Uh, the other day I started hearing kia, kia, kia in my yard and, and I looked up and there were a couple of red-shouldered hawks and I saw them courting and then just today, this, this photo was taken this morning, this is the male and he's building a, a nest um, uh, right in the oak tree across the street from my, my yard. And I just live on a half acre in a highly urban area in, in, in Meriden. But it's not just birds that you can benefit. And one of the key things is to plant natives. And, and why do native plants matter? That's because insects and plants and birds have all co-evolved over time to really, to, to depend on one another. Certain insects, certain plants are the host plants for certain species of insects. Certain plants provide nectar for the insects. In turn, those insects pollinate those plants. And birds time, the, time their migration to arrive when certain plants may be in fruit or in flower. 
So this may look like a, a, a plate of insects, but to a bird, uh, it, it is dinner. And if you talk to any researcher who's worked on nestling birds and you say, what do parents, what do the, what do the parents feed their chicks? They're going to say, little green caterpillars. And almost even our inveterate seed eaters, like cardinals and chickadees, switch over to caterpillars in the nesting season because they need that protein. Think about it, a bird grows to its full size in four weeks, four to six weeks. All the growing in its entire life. As soon as it hatches from that, that egg, it's got to eat and eat and eat and eat until it reaches full size, and then the parents say, get out of here. <laughs> so this is a wood thrush that was gathering up caterpillars on a road, actually, uh, 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 underneath a whole bunch of chestnut oaks. And native plants can be beautiful. This was this is a photo courtesy of Doug Ptolemy, an amazing expert on native plants, and I really highly recommend his books. I have, I have a photo of one later. And this is a native plant garden that he particularly liked. With, you can see the azaleas and the rhododendrons, and this is a shade garden. It's absolutely beautiful. Another uh, photo by, by Doug Ptolemy, and these are, uh, the, this is the cardinal lobelias. These are various species of, of Joe pieweed. Uh, native plants can be beautiful. So what are some things you can take into account in various levels in your yard? Well, first of all, in your lawn, let these guys grow up. These are violets. They're native to our area. Uh, you, could, you can borrow some from a friend if you don't have any in your yard, and they'll eventually spread. Uh, they fix nitrogen from the atmosphere right into the soil. But, and they're beautiful. They'll be blooming in a couple of weeks now, and if you have a lot of, of violets in your yard, it is just absolutely gorgeous. But importantly, after those uh, leaves die back, even if you mow your lawn, in the late summer, these guys sniff out the tubers of the dormant violets, and they will lay their eggs on it. This is a great spangled fritillary. The butterflies in the fritillary family, they feed on violets. And what they do is they lay their eggs on the dormant tubers. They win winter over as eggs. And then in the spring, when the fresh shoots come up, they eat the violet uh, leaves and then you get uh, uh, fritillaries. So even just having these violets in your lawn, you're gonna, they can smell that from miles away with these antennae. So you're gonna get more of these butterflies visiting your cone flowers if you have violets in your yard than, than otherwise. Another thing, clovers. A great source of nectar, again, a nit another nitrogen fixer. And uh, uh, again, there are certain butterflies that like to forage right near the ground. And our native white clover, this is birdfoot trefoil here. Uh, this is actually the non-native uh, red clover, which I really love, but it's, it's not native. Um, this, these are great nectar sources for a wide variety of butterflies and, and other pollinators. And there are some really amazing uh, butterflies in our area. And we've all heard about the plight of monarchs. And we are, we've probably all heard about the associations monarchs have with specific plants. This is a tiger swallowtail. They don't have as, as strict associations. They don't require milkweed like the monarchs do. They, they, they'll, they'll, nest, I mean, they'll lay their eggs sometimes in, in, in uh, cherry trees, apple trees, uh, birches, a wide variety of native, native trees. This is an uh, American lady, or maybe a painted lady. I'm a little rusty. I get rusty on my butterflies this time of year, and they're very similar. And there's some really amazing butterflies that you can track to our yard, including the black swallowtail, uh, the ladies, the red admirals, the uh, red spotted purple, monarchs. Uh, this is a common buckeye and an eastern tiger swallowtail. The black swallowtail likes to feed on foods in you know, plants in the family of the carrots. So things like parsley, dill, actual carrots, Queen Anne's lace, if you plant that in your yard, they'll sniff it out, they'll come, they'll lay their eggs, and you'll get these really cool looking green and yellow and black caterpillars. They'll get into a chrysalis phase, and eventually you get this beautiful adult butterfly. Which, so if you have those host plants, they're going to come and visit your butterfly bushes much more, much more often. Milkweeds, very important. They're host plants for, for monarchs and a whole wide variety of, of other insects. Uh, but they're also 
very important nectar sources. And they always do the butterfly counts around July 1st, uh, or, or July, somewhere in the, in the frame of July 1st to July 4th. And the reason for that is because that's when the milkweed, is, the common milkweed, is in bloom. And that's such an important nectar source that certain butterflies only fly during that period when the, the, when the um, uh, milkweed is in bloom. This happens to be an Acadian hair streak. But if you can find a nice milkweed stand, it's not just for monarchs. You find a huge variety of wonderful butterflies, including a lot of in this hair streak family. But monarchs really, really need them uh, because they only lay their eggs on, uh, on milkweeds. And there's a, there are several species of milkweed. That last one was the common milkweed. It tends to get a little leggy and not the most attractive plant. It's a great place to put in a quiet corner of your yard. You don't want to put it in your, your garden itself because it can take over. But there are other more tame species of milkweed that are just as good host plants, and they bloom at different times of year. So if you have many species of milkweed in your yard, you're going to prolong that source of nectar. It's not just going to be that one shot of a week when that common milkweed is in bloom. This ha happens to be swamp milkweed. It grows only about knee high, really a beautiful plant. It smells wonderful if you stick your nose in there, always covered in wasps, butterflies, and it's still a host plant for monarchs. And, and it's perfectly suitable for even the most formal gardens. It's so another one. This is the uh, Asclepius tuberosa, uh, the, the butterfly weed. Grows in the sandiest and droughtiest of conditions. Uh, it's a very, very, very drought tolerant plant. Um, don't transplant it. It's not going to transplant well, so buy it at a nursery or buy seeds. It'll do fine, uh, especially if you have dry areas. And it's a really amazing nectar source for a wide variety of butterflies, including it's only one of two species of plants where this butterfly gets its nectar. This is a highly endangered species of butterfly that's found in Connecticut, something called a northern metal mark. And the only place it gets nectar is from butterfly weed and then a small wild variety of, of Rudbeckia, black-eyed Susan. It's really a beautiful butterfly. This doesn't do it justice. You can see the metal marks in these lines here, which are really iridescent metal. But having these butterfly gardens and, and, and nectar and pollen available is going to attract a wide variety of insects, and many of our birds are insect eaters. This is just in my tiny little butterfly garden in Meriden. It's, it's probably five feet wide by 20 feet long. And this is a uh, prairie warbler. It just showed up there in migration. You're never going to prairie warbler nesting in a yard like mine. But I've had oh, 27 different species of warblers in my yard. Because I manage it organically, I don't put the chemicals there, and I have a lot of nectar. And nectar is the conduit that goes from sunlight, creates the energy, and then that fuels the insects that goes up the food chain. Also, the structure is important. Some great taller flowers that we want to, may want to include. One of my favorites is the, pale, is the purple coneflower, which is native to the eastern U.S., not strictly native to this zip code, if you will. There's a pale coneflower. That's native to our, to our zip code. Uh, but uh, the simple, the simple um, heirloom variety of the purple coneflower, the wild variety, is probably the most productive but I love the fact that you can get all sorts of different colors. You can get white ones, you can get orange ones, you can get red ones. Uh, you know, these ones tend to spread throughout your garden, and that's a good thing to have a whole bunch of these things there. But you can also intermix some of the fancy ones and create some colors, and, and, and the insects like them as well. This is a native sweat bee. The great thing about coneflowers is the seeds they produce are also a favorite of many species of birds, including finches, goldfinches. In the late summer, the goldfinches get out there and they pull, pull the, uh, the petals off of your coneflowers, hoping to ripen the seeds faster. because they, they can't wait for those seeds to get ripe so they can feed on them. And if you leave them standing throughout the winter, you might be lucky enough to have red poles visit them, or this happens to be a pine siskin. Goldenrods. Um, some of you may think you're allergic to goldenrods, but goldenrod is actually an insect-pollinated uh, uh, flower. It doesn't get its pollen up into the wind. It needs insects to, to, to be pollinated. And its pollen is also not the type that is conducive to allergies. It's a very round grain of pollen. The ragweeds and the, and the wind-pollinated, the pines, the, the maples, the oaks, they have this really ragged hook uh, shape to their pollen. That, that, that's what causes our allergies. But uh, there are many species of, of, of uh, 
of goldenrods. They bloom at different times of year. Some of them are a little bit more thugs than others, uh, but I, I could probably talk about uh, a different species of goldenrod all day. This happens to be a red-banded hair streak. It used to be a rare butterfly in Connecticut, but now they're, they're, not, they're uh, fairly wide, common and widespread. This is another uh, species of butterfly that had been unheard of in Connecticut until about 10 years ago. A lot of species are moving northwards, and butterflies are big evidence of that. And this is just one of my favorite plants in the garden. That's the New England aster. And one of the reasons why it's one of my, one of my favorites is because it blooms so abundantly and so late. You can cut it back down to the ground up to about July 1st, and it will bloom right up to the, uh, the, the hard frost. And it's a real popular uh, uh, plant with, with these skippers and with other pollinators. There are, certain, uh, there are certain pollinators that require specialized flowers, including hum hummingbirds. And there are species of moth as well. Basically, if you want to attract hummingbirds, a tube-shaped flower and red flowers, that's the way to go. That happens to be a, a, a bush honeysuckle, that, a native one that, that has red flowers. But this is one of the best plants. This is the cardinal lobelia. It's, it grows in partial shade, almost to full shade. It, it blooms, uh, uh, you know, in, in July. It, it, and the hummingbirds just love it. This is columbine. That's important because it's a spring flower. So just as the hummingbirds are arriving back and they're hungry, they have very high metabolisms they need to feed, uh, this, this uh, native flower is in bloom. And then there are some non-natives like pineapple sage, which can prolong the season for them. Uh, they're, they're a very late bloomer, and they're not native, uh, but they also are not invasive. You can put up special feeders for hummingbirds, but that requires uh, more time than I have to keep, uh, to keep them clean. If that, that nectar in there gets cloudy, it's toxic to the hummingbirds. So uh, if you do put up hummingbirds, you gotta keep them clean. I've decided I'm never gonna keep my hummingbird cle feeders clean enough, so I, I do it through gardening to attract my hummingbirds. They also have to compete with the yellow jackets. <laughs> Another great flower, this is the uh, red bee bomb. All, all, all varieties of bee bomb, but especially red, are great uh, uh, nectar sources for hummingbirds. And uh, it's not just for hummingbirds that like these red flowers. This is a species called a cloudless sulfur. It's a very, fairly, almost the size of a monarch uh, yellow butterfly. And normally you just see them whizzing through your yard. They don't stop. But if you have a late blooming lobelia in your yard, they'll stop over and get nectar and you can actually see them up close. They're a beautiful butterfly. A lot of our, our, our bumblebees are in trouble and our other native pollinators. And this is... Um, um, Astagi, um, it, it's, I forget the, uh, yeah, I forget, forget the common name for it right now, but it's what you, you, you what was that again? Blue yeah, Blue Fortune. Um, it, it smells like black licorice when you, when, when you crunch, crunch, crunch up the leaves. It's a favorite of many species of bees and wasps. And uh, you've been here, probably heard in the news that it, there's a headline, the bumblebee is now endangered. It's not all bumblebees, it's, it's a particular bumblebee, the rusty patch bum, bumblebee, bumblebee. It's actually found in Connecticut. It's one of the last places in the east that it was found was in Connecticut. Uh, but uh, bumblebees, native bumblebees in general, there are many species in trouble, and uh, this is a, a, a great plant for them. And if you have this healthy, organic garden, you never know what wonders you're going to find. Uh, I was out uh, weeding with my daughter one day f several years ago, and we found this, this green scarab beetle. It's about the, it was about the size of a quarter, just this iridescent metallic green. This photo doesn't even do it justice. We found about three or four of them out there. You just, you know, um, if you're not seeing something wonderful in your garden, look closer because it's there. Some other taller plants you might want to take into account. Pokeweed, you're not going to buy it anywhere. It's going to show up on its own. But uh, this is just a plug not to get rid of all of it because the birds love those berries, especially yellow-breasted chats. Almost every time you see a yellow-breasted chat in the fall, it's going to be in a stand of this pokeweed. Roses, there are, uh, you know, the ornamental roses are wonderful. There's an invasive species of rose, 
The multi-flower rose, don't plant that one. Try to get rid of it if you have it. Uh, but there are three wonderful native species of rose, the Virginia rose, the Carolina rose, and the swamp rose. They all smell wonderful, and they all provide these small hips that the birds like, and great structure for nesting as well. The service berries, a great way to attract cedar waxwings. They, like, they come up and they, they try to get all these, these fruit before they even ripen. This is a funny looking creature. And if you plant something called a prickly ash in a back quiet corner of your yard, northern prickly ash, you might get these creatures. They look much better when they're adults. <laughs> it's a giant swallowtail. And one of their host plants is the northern prickly ash, the one that they lay their eggs on in this part of the world. And they're actually, a, they used to be an endangered species in Connecticut, very rare. They've been moving up from the south. And if you plant that prickly ash in the back corner of your yard, you're going to get a lot more giant swallowtails visiting your butterfly garden. Spice bush, another thing that you can plant in a quiet and dark corner of your yard. Gets these fruit that the birds really like. The leaves smell like lemon when you crinkle them up. It's the main host plant for this beautiful butterfly, the, the uh, spice bush swallowtail. Some, uh, some other um, native shrubs that can be really good, dogwoods. There's a lot of varieties. Native dogwoods is what I suggest. The red osier dogwood is one of my favorite. And the reason it has red, red stems is it's trying to attract birds. Birds see red very well. So they get in there, and they start foraging around, They're getting all sorts of invertebrates in there. And a little hedge of red osier dogwood is one of the best ways to protect migrating land birds. That happens to be a Tennessee warbler, a little closer version of that. That's what the male Tennessee warblers look like. And it even can attract some birds that you would normally think of up high in the trees. This is a Blackburnian warbler, and it came down to forage in this stand of uh, red osier dogwood. It's a great plant to have in the, in the wintertime. It's a great contrast with the snow. You can get some pretty photos if you have it near your bird feeder. This happens to be an American tree sparrow. There are other species of dogwood. There's the pagoda dogwood. That's wonderful. It gets berries in the summer. This is one of my favorite trees, actually the berry of one of my favorite trees, the flowering dogwood, Cornus florida. Anybody know what kind of bird this is? They're kind of nondescript this time of year, but if you see it, they time their migration to come through when the flowering dogwood has fruit on it, because it's a very high fat fruit. And, uh, or maybe the tree timed its fruiting to when the scarlet tanager is moving through. This is, um, this is winterberry. It happens to be a white-throated sparrow in it. Now, the birds don't like the winterberry, and that's why it's important, because it persists throughout the winter, because it tastes horrible. But this time of year, as they're moving back, there's no fruit. So birds that, on a cold day, there may not be many insects or worms or other invertebrates for the robin to eat. Cedar waxwings, the service berries aren't out yet. They come in, and they just take all of the winterberry uh, and just strip it this time of year. And it's especially important if you get a snowstorm after some of these early spring migrants arrive back. So winterberry is very important. It's also great for pollinators. When winterberry is in flower, you need a male and a female. It is just totally busy with all sorts of tiny little insects. The ericaceae, the ericaceous shrubs, the blueberries, the rhododendrons, the heathers, the mountain laurels, they are magnets for many species of moths and other insects, therefore providing a lot of food for the birds. This happens to be a worm-eating warbler. They like to nest in mountain laurels. Viburnums, many species of, of native viburnums, the maple leaf viburnum, the um, nannyberry uh, viburnum, the uh, um, uh, cranberry bush viburnum. There are, there are some non-native viburnums, like the uh, double fire viburnum and the uh, Korean spice Viburnum. I have a Korea spice viburnum in my yard. It's the most wonderful smell. So again, I'm not a strict nativist, but it's the native viburnums I'm talking about. Arrowwood, maple leaf viburnum, nannyberry, hobblebush, witch hobble is another example. They produce these low quality fruits in, in the fall. This is a, uh, they're also great structure in the spring. This is a Wilson's warbler. 
in a uh, bush of, of uh, cranberry bush viburnum. Bayberry. It's, there's actually, it's also known as myrtle, wax myrtle. These are another fruit that persists into the winter. And there's actually a species of bird named after this. The myrtle warbler, also known as the yellow rump warbler. And the only thing they eat in the wintertime, if they're, if they're around in the wintertime, you can be guaranteed that there's a bush of myrtle around somewhere. This happens to be uh, picking up s some of those waxy berries off the ground. All right, you're not going to plant this one. This is poison ivy. Um, and, but poison ivy is incredibly uh, uh, beneficial to the birds, again, with those fruits in the fall. So if you have some poison ivy in a quiet corner of your yard where you're not going to get it and your dog's not going to get into it, uh, it's a little plug to leave it alone. This is a, another uh, uh, myrtle warbler eating that. Another vine that people often mistake for poison ivy is Virginia creeper. And letting that grow up your tree, it's not going to kill your tree. It's going to increase the substrate on which birds can forage and find food. It gets these red, beautiful red foliage in the fall that attracts birds in. It's their, their, their fruit flag. And then it has these big, juicy berries that the birds like. Red cedar. Uh, it can get to be about 80 feet tall. It's very slow growing, uh, but it's a great tree. And uh, it gets these, these waxy berries. Uh, cedar waxwings are named after it. A whole wide variety of, of birds like it. But importantly, it's also a host plant for many species of moths. And therefore, uh, a, a great food source. This is it, a prairie warbler in breeding plumage. And this species is a butterfly. It's a juniper hair streak. The only food for it are junipers and, and red cedars. Some smaller trees, chokeberries, choke cherries. They grow in the shade. Cat birds love them. Other fruit eating birds in the summertime love them. It also uh, supports a wide variety of insects. Cat birds really love them. Black cherry, one of my favorite trees. It's got that craggly bark. Great hunting substrate for the creepers and the woodpeckers and the nuthatches. Gets these abundant fruits in late summer. It also hosts a huge number of native uh, lepidopterans, butterflies and moths, 456 species. So that's lots of bird food as well, even when it's not in, uh, in fruit. And also it gets these, uh, the flowers in, in, in spring migration as well. Indigo buntings love black cherries as do uh, uh, Baltimore and Orchard Orioles. Oaks, one of the most important things in the landscape for migrating birds are oaks. And the, anybody who's an experienced birder knows in May, the time when you get, want to go out and see birds is when the oaks are in flower. And hopefully before the leaves get on there because you can see the birds better. But oaks provide a huge amount of uh, food for, for the caterpillars, the lepidopteran caterpillars. These are their flowers hanging down here, these little tendrils that hang down. They're wind pollinated, and the caterpillars, uh, the moths and butterflies, lay their eggs in those flowers, and then as the birds are moving through, they hunt in these flowers looking for insects and probably some eggs to eat. And I've actually even seen them eating these, these, uh, these, these flower strands. And the place to go find a wide variety of warblers is in a nice, big, mature oak that's got some sunshine sitting in it, uh, shining on it. 537 species of caterpillars uh, are, are hosted by oaks, our native oaks. White oak, black oak, bur oak, um, pin oak. Uh, doesn't really matter what, what, what type of, of oak. There's even some, some shrub oaks that are really great, the bear oak. A ginkgo, it's a great tree, kind of smells a little bit bad. Only four species of, of caterpillars uh, 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 are hosted by that. A few miscellaneous really big trees that I like. Nyssa sylvatica. It's the, bl the black gum, also known as the pepperidge tree. Gets these red, red uh, uh, fruit flag leaves and has these big, juicy, blue, blueberry-looking things that, that are just a favorite of woodpeckers, including the pileated woodpecker. And thrushes. This happens to be a gray-cheeked thrush. Tulip tree, one of our tallest and fastest growing trees in the area. Great substrate on the bark. 
gets these flowers that hummingbirds and other and and other nectar lovers will come into, including many species of butterflies. Gets seeds on it that the finches really like. It's a really a great native tree. Sassafras tends to spread by suckers. So if you have a, an area that you don't mind being dominated by sassafras, it's a great native tree. Again, that craggly bark again, it's a host plant for many species of butterflies and moths, including spicebush swallowtails and tiger swallowtails. Gets fruit that turkeys really love and other species of birds. Hackberry. Even if you live right on the coast, so New Canaan doesn't have a seacoast here, but this is a very salt tolerant tree and it's native to our area. It's a very hardy tree, slow growing tree. It gets these fruit that the birds love and there are sp specific butterflies that only lay their eggs in hackberry trees. This is a hackberry emperor. And if you don't have hackberry trees in your area, you don't have hackberry emperors. There's another one called the tawny emperor that looks very similar. And then also this butterfly, it's a funny looking butterfly, it's something called an American snout. Again, its, it's host plant is, is the hackberry. Birches are great. They get these things that are like cones. They're called catkins. They're filled with these little tiny seeds that are very nutritious and loved by finches, including red poles. This happens to be a hoary red pole here, and this is a common red pole. If you have a stand of birches in your yard, they're a great way to attract winter finches, pine siskins, gold finches, and, and, and red poles. They're also attractive. The gray birch is very attractive to migrating warblers in the fall. We don't know why, but for some reason. Conifers are also very important. Uh, this happens to be a pitch pine, a native species of pine, but any of our native conifers is a good addition to your landscape to just create a variety of habitat. This happens to be a white-winged crossbill. There are certain birds that, that, uh, uh, that like to feed on the seeds of cones. These have a specialized bill that can actually help them to pry open and get the pine nuts out of, out of certain species of, of pines. But other things like red-breasted nuthatch, uh, chickadees, Titmice all really like pine cones. It also creates a great shelter in the wintertime for raptors, including owls. This happens to be a long-eared owl, and it's in a different kind of evergreen. This is an American holly, another really great native tree. A little plug for brush piles. This happens to be a Lincoln sparrow. Create great shelter for a wide variety of birds, especially the sparrows. And you can even do things uh, specifically for the sparrows, creating a feed plot, just tilling up a small area in your yard. You can buy specified mi mixes for it. This was at our Smith Richardson Sanctuary in Westport. And um, uh, these are some foxtail millets that we put in there. We bought some seed mixes from Pheasants Forever. And uh, even just tilling it up, you'll get the, the wild foxtail grasses growing in there. But you can also mix it up and put in uh, um, uh, uh, some, some wildflowers as well. This happens to be a good sparrow habitat at Harkness Memorial State Park. These are some of the native giant foxtails that just grow up in disturbed soil. So I'm not a stick, strict nativist. Native, what I think you should do is incorporate some native plants into your landscape. There are a few exceptions. I love star magnolias. They get these nutritious fruits in fall migration. Swamp magnolia, native to a little bit further south of here. A great host plant for including tiger swallowtails and uh, spicebush swallowtails. But again, they get these fruit that are ripe just in time for the thrush migration. They get these red pods that burst open just about when the thrushes are arriving. Crab apples are somewhat controversial. There are some species of crab apples that are invasive, but uh, they have a dual benefit. Sometimes they, their seeds, their fruits persist into the wintertime. And in the spring, you get migrant warblers that are in there, and they're getting the worms from the apples, which are actually caterpillars. And if you're lucky and you have a crab apple in your yard, you might get a visit from something really rare. This is a bohemian waxwing rare relative of the uh, cedar waxwing. Also, pine grosbeaks like them as a lot. But check with your um, uh, nurseryman or woman uh, to make sure that it isn't an invasive species of, of crab apple. And butterfly bush, um, that's very controversial. I like butterfly bush. All mine died last winter, but um, or the winter before. No, it was last winter. Um, if you deadhead it, they're not going to spread. So, and they'll also stay blooming right up to the last frost. There are very few plants that provide this amount of nectar 
all the way through the season, right up to the first frost. But important to deadhead them so they don't spread, uh, and uh, they, they aren't cl considered invasive in this area, but uh, are in other, some part, other parts of the world. This happens to be a black-throated green warbler in my, one of my butterfly bushes. And annuals. Sunflowers, I love sunflowers. Put a sunflower patch, throw sunflowers into your feed plot, and cosmos. I would love to have a field of cosmos like that. They're, they're absolutely gorgeous. The pollinators love them, and uh, the seeds are, are, big, uh, are, are relished by many species of finches. Now, some more photos of our, this is our Smith Richardson Sanctuary in Westport, and we decided to put down a cover crop of, of, uh, uh, of millets and, and a feed plot. We threw in some zinnias in there for color, the deer ate all our sunflowers, but uh, it was great for the pollinators, monarchs, black swallowtails, uh, red admirals, and then it became sparrow dice in the fall with all these different millets that were getting ripe, and there was just amazing variety of, 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 of uh, uh, seed-eating birds. But the whole idea is creating balanced communities, healthy and balanced communities, and it, by doing that, you may even be benefiting fish because if you're improving, protecting water quality, you're gonna improve your local watersheds and it's gonna be beneficial to all sorts of things, including fish and even to Long Island Sound. This is a roseate spoonbill that showed up in Long Island Sound last year. Very quickly, some resources, Bringing Nature Home by Doug Ptolemy. I'm sure they have it here in the library. This is a book from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources called Landscaping for Wildlife. You can take a picture of it with your phone if you want uh, uh, to, to get the names. This is the Audubon Society to Attracting Bi Birds by Steve Kress. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful book. It goes into all sorts of things like landscaping, feeding, uh, water, all that sort of stuff. And again, bringing nature home, another plug for that wonderful book. And then something specific to Connecticut. Let's get one more camera out. Something specific to Connecticut is this book, which is by Peter Pacone, and you can download this for free if you just Google this name, Peter Pacone, uh, P-I-C-O-N-E, and Enhancing Your Backyard Habitat for Wildlife, or if you have a QR code reader on your phone, you can go directly there. And finally, thank you. <laughs>